Hi, my name's Sat Baines. I'd like to show you around my restaurant, Restaurant Sat Baines with the Rooms, and show you all my kitchens. Welcome, this is uh, the original kitchen. So this is where we all started. I started in 1999 in October, and this kitchen was this size, but over here was wine fridges, and over here was the pot wash. So then in 2007 we built the chef's table. This table weighs over 200 kilos, and the idea was that we wanted something solid oak that lasted the test of time. So as you can look at the structure underneath, it took a hell of a lot of uh, stabilising because every time you tapped it, it would vibrate. So we had to get it really reinforced. But this table is where we have our family meal every day, uh, 11 o'clock and 5 o'clock for the staff. Also, we can see six guests here that have access to the kitchen. The chefs are in and out. It's a really informal uh, environment, but also they get to see what goes on behind the scenes of a professional kitchen. Okay, so when we did the kitchen and the chef's table, we had to make sure we had a pot wash big enough so what we did, we invested in the pot wash area. We wanted it to be so efficient and ergonomic that it was one of these things that kind of lasted the test of time. On a good busy night, we can get through 3,000 pieces of crockery cut with glassware. So the way it works is all the plates are done here, pans and glass polishing. Four months ago, we had the, an extension built, which is our new pastry kitchen, also our prep area. So this here, was the external wall with a fire exit going into the garden and to the car park. So what we decided was to add on to the building. So if you walk in, this is the new um, pastry section. So it's been a godsend in terms of space because all of us used to be in there. Now you've got this massive pass and a little chef's table over there as well where guests can actually come in. But you've got also areas where we can do prep in the day. So we'll do all the fish and shellfish and meat on that side. We've got a coffee station there, we've got a brat pan, we've got a big oven to do all the bread. So it's given us space that we've never had before, really. And because all this equipment is used all the time by both kitchens, we've had a central island built for it. So access is all about easy access, how we can get to it, and also keep it very tidy and efficient. So when we built this kitchen in August, um, it's something that we worked with Electrolux this year, a professional range. So we had all the kits fitted by them because obviously the professional range is something that we need to look at that's hard work, hard wearing and also has a really good warranty because obviously in a professional kitchen you're going to give the, the product a really good hammer so the idea behind it all was to get a really good company that we worked with in the past to fit it in to, to give us what we're after you know. So this is our sommelier station we had this built because obviously the wine pairing is very important to what we do here with the tasting menu format and we're selling now probably 70% of our guests are going for wine pairing. So we had to have this built, so it's a separate station, but also you could take the amount of traffic. So on any good day, you could be doing over like 600 glasses of wine. And the idea behind this space is that it's where all the pressure has gone from the restaurant where you're allowed to play. So I wanted somewhere where you can physically focus on a specific idea of, let's look at yeast, let's look at caramelization, let's look at different flowers, let's look at crunch and the idea there it took all the pressure off service so over the road there's obviously eight or nine chefs all busy ready for getting ready for prep you haven't really got time to physically explore as we would like to so by having this room it's meant that we can actually put time aside and just have one full-time member of staff working on all new dishes ideologies philosophies and physically log them so we've got a almost a database of all the experiments that we've done so the restaurant's quite intimate we've got two rooms we've got the conservatory and the restaurant there we can do 40 covers um, all the tables are very um, they're all round and the reason for that is a lot more I think sociable and I d I've never really liked sharp t sharp edges to be honest but the beauty of the tables are is that it's enough space so you can actually feel that it's yours for the evening and it's not too tight and you're not too close to the other tables. We've had things built like these cutlery blocks and the idea is that because we do tasting menu only, you're not being interfered with all the time by waiters to keep putting cutlery down because I think it, if we can reduce one journey to the table so you can enjoy your evening and not get hindered by staff trying to keep putting cutlery down and taking it away that way you, and also you can eat with what you want so if you just want to eat with a spoon you can there's no kind of hierarchy or um, etiquette 
in terms of you can use a knife and fork or a spoon and fork. And again, it, it's leaving the onus to the guest rather than being dictated to. You have to eat that with that, that cutlery. I'm going to do two dishes today. The first one I'm going to do is a duck liver um, muesli. So the idea behind it is that uh, we wanted to recreate um, a duck liver dish <clears throat> using kind of luxury ingredients. So this one's almost like a duck liver royale, which was ultimately made with chicken stock, soy, gelatine and duck liver. And you actually blend it till you get to a certain temperature. And then once you do that, you then pass it once it's seasoned. And then you end up with this really nice, that used to be like a set custard almost. Something quite decadent, uh, had a lovely kind of luxurious mouthfeel. So the idea behind it was almost like a pate and toast scenario where you had something really smooth and silky. Then you had the toast, which was crunchy. We used to serve it years ago with a little fine uh, French bean salad with shallots. So you had acidity there. And then to finish it off for, again, a little bit of a crunch and a bit of texture, we've done it with uh, granola this time. So what we've done is when you look at the dish, it's quite confusing because it looks like... Um, it looks like a breakfast, it looks like a muesli. But when you eat it, because the actual duck liver is frozen and it's smashed, so it looks all broken up, you end up with this incredible um, sensation of something very cold. But as soon as it hits the temperature of the mouth, it starts becoming very mouth filling and also melting up to the blood temperature. And you end up with something really silky. But because it's in the tasting menu format, we have to be really conscious about not giving you something so filling so early on so the idea is it's about balance it's about acidity it's about freshness something that's not really related with duck liver so this 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 was the key thinking behind this of how can we get this ingredient or this feeling of something that's almost got some historical value i.e patty and toast i know it works well it's one of the classics how can we get that sensation again and this is our inter our interpretation of something that's very um very traditional the other dish I'm doing today is uh, pearl barley, something that we use a lot at the restaurant. This time it's actually served with smoked garlic, um, some lemon and some smoked marabone. And the marabone itself is, is just been poached, uh, sorry, popped out of the, the bone itself. And we, before that we actually smoke it in a, in a cold smoker. And what you do, you get this incredible, because it's quite porous, you get this incredible flavour. And then it also gives this kind of look, kind of heady flavour to the dish, especially this time of year being winter. So you get this lovely, again, comforting kind of dish, which has got the pearl barley. We finish it with a little bit of parmesan, and then we just put a sheet of oxtail, which has been braised for several hours. It's been shredded and then pressed in a tureen, and you slice it cold, you put it under the grill, it starts to melt. Then you put some pickled onion on top of that, and we finish it with the dashi. So again, trying to get away from heavy sauces because the dish is quite rich, the dashi itself lends a, a nice smokiness from the tuna as well, from the bonito. But then it's got this cleaning parsley oil with it, so it's a split sauce. And what happens is as you go through the dish, we finish it sorry, with some um, deep fried onions for texture. But as you go through the dish, you get this incredible gelatinous uh, oxtail. But because it's so thin, you're not getting lots of weight. So every dish we're trying to work on it has to have a balance of having levels of acidity, but also fulfilling um, a tasting menu format but not oversating you too early. It's one of the key components of what we're trying to do with the restaurant is where that dish sits and how does it fit in that menu is so crucial to where the guest's journey is at that point. And we've got to think what's going to go before that dish and what's going after to ultimately give you this whole flavor journey and, and an experience.